Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. And we're following on looking a little bit more around um, personality traits. And the one that we're doing in this week's episode is the passive aggressive personality trait. That's right. And I think um, off, off camera, you're talking about that book you like by personal adaptations by Ian Stewart and Paul Ware. And they talk about different styles of character. I think they call this person, if I'm like, is it the playful resistor? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. 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 Which is. Is a, yeah, I'm right. Good. Which is a really clue into how to work with these styles, if you like. And these are the people who present quite passive and in their passivity quite aggressive or may appear like that yeah. um, of course beneath all that is the um, child that's not been heard or not been attuned to and the child in an attempt to be seen often says silently if not overtly fuck off yeah Go away. <laughs> Quite regular in the therapy room as well. Get well they're allowed to, but in their, <laughs> <laughs> in, their um, yeah, in their family of origin, it might have been a different story. They might have had said fuck off sullenly. Yes. Um, and uh, you have a you have the birth of what would be called an oppositional character. Yeah. And um, that's the way they've survived. That's the way they've attempted to get recognition. Unfortunately usually negative recognition from their parents of origin yeah but any recognition is better than no recognition for human beings well that's that's certainly true because otherwise they'll shrivel up and die so yeah. in this character is a it's, it's it's an attempt to um get their needs met a desperate attempt to be seen a desperate attempt to be understood a desperate attempt to, you know, really, uh, how can I explain this? I suppose I've just explained it quite well, to get their needs there to be understood. And for the parents just to turn around and said, well, you did a really good job. So in other words, to get validation. Yeah. But the way they choose it, you know, the way they attempt to get their needs met, the way they attempt to make connection, the way they attempt to be intimate, if you like, actually may result in pushing them, pushing other people away. Yeah. Um, because it's they their attempts to get connection are often quite aggressive. Or can be seen as aggressive. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And leaving the other person not wanting to make that connection. <laughs> Yeah, that push not, and pull again type of thing. Yeah, leaves them not wanting to initiate. Yeah. Now the levels of passivity are high. Now again, if we talk about traits rather than personality disorders again, they're still high. So procrastination, for example, not doing anything, expecting to other people to think for them and then they disagree with them. Yeah. Impossibly. Um, often seen as oppositional characters. But the most, one of the most um, main features is the attempt by the client to get the therapist to do the thinking for them. And then when they do the thinking for them, to disagree with them aggressively. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does, it does. Oh, anyway, I just wondered. It's yeah, no. like, is that identification again? No, well, this I don't, I don't have the passive aggressive thing, but it uh, does. Your clients, you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, under, understand that completely. There's kind of like that learnt helplessness, but then they they come out on the attack. Mm. Yeah. And that's the phase. Come out on the attack. Yeah. You know, it, it's an it's a way. It's a desperate attempt, though, to make connection and to. 
kind of let the other person know I'm here. You know, I am here. I want you to meet me. But actually, what they do pushes people away. Yeah. In most cases. Again, you know, and touching on what you said in the last episode, it, I think it's really important as as the therapist to not take it personally. <laughs> that's the bit <laughs> not to take it personally yeah yeah, yeah. they go into it you see you know for most clients the therapist will represent the authority figure yes yeah now the passive aggressive client will go into battle with the projected authority figure and if the projected authority figure then goes into battle with them it's the same as going to battle with the paranoid that we talked about in the other podcast. Yeah. That will go nowhere. In fact, there'll be a repeat of history. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it, it's interesting. So, you know, that we, I know we spoke about it quite early on about the pacing of, of the therapy sessions and things. And I think sometimes you can tell by the response or the atmosphere in the room whether the pace needs to slow down a little bit whether they're they're feeling under attack or i don't know that you can see straight through them you need to just tread water for a while in the therapy room sometimes i think yeah because they will seek out what is called in ta negative strokes yeah negative recognition because that's been their diet as a childhood yeah. So they will scorn authority. Uh, they will be resentful of authority. They will go into sulky behaviour. They will, they will induce the parent, i.e. the therapist, in some way to push them away by this so-called, in inverted commas, bad behaviour. Yeah, which again so, is a protection mechanism. <laughs> it's... Yeah, it's, it, and you are, you're right, and, you know, passive-aggressive clients who have grown up with that way of an attempt to get strokes or recognition are very good at um, promoting these battles with their therapists. Mm. Because if you trace it back to their history, that's exactly what they did with their parents, because they didn't get the validation, they weren't met, they weren't understood. So, fuck you then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act out, and then you will bloody see me. Yeah. <laughs> and and you'll bloody see me and then I won't then I won't actually take these strokes in the first place. Yeah, because I don't want them. Because I don't want them. <laughs> yeah. So you go around in this sort of uh you know and that's a wonderful example of it, what you just did then, Bob, is literally the the arms crossed, whatever it is, that is literally what I think you would see in a, a therapy room. It's yeah, I yeah. don't want it anywhere. Don't want it anywhere. That's yeah. exactly it. And that's that's their frame of reference. So they play these battles to get validation, et cetera, et cetera. And when they get it, they push it away because mm. so they don't need and they don't want it. And then you've got the whole process goes around again. So you've got these repetitive behaviours, uh, which we call games and transaction analysis, which you know, is an attempt maladaptively to get their needs met. It doesn't actually work, yeah. but it actually works to a certain level in their childhood where they got uh, some levels of recognition yeah and they attempt to enact the same process out in life and of course in relationships then the problems really start do you find that sometimes there's a fine line in the therapy room of buying into it into the the adaptation and and playing that part and not buying into it is, is there a, a point where we need to play the game up to a certain stance so that the client stays in the room and keeps coming back well it's interesting about this because if you talk about games and behaviors repetitive behaviors there's many ways we can do that one is what you've just talked about where you may stay in the game and uh, play the game out and then see what's the um, script, the payoff that they actually take and then actually do a bit of educative therapy and take it back to their early history. And uh, you can do that. You can actually 
do some ed educative therapy before the games actually begin. Um, but what you're talking about is staying in the behavioural. Uh, it is a fine dance because the problem, the problem without moving to some educative therapy, is that you may reenact its history. Yeah, but it is a fine line in playing it out so that it's familiar to them and they feel comfortable in the situation somehow and refusing to do it and them up in the ante playing an even bigger game somehow yeah, yeah, you can do you can do that Jeff. it's a bit of a trap though because they'll be better than better at better at it than you oh, yeah so, so i'll tell you a good way to work i think clinically with um, people with this type of ways of defending is through humour. Because if you can get to their playful child, this is why this is why I think Ian Stewart and Van Joy's nicknamed this type of character, playful resistor, is because if you can get, if you can use your own humour to, to bypass those defences of uh, resistance yeah. and get to the, the child which has been not validated or not met you know that then then you then i've always found that a really good channel now i've naturally got good humor but i don't, I don't think of using it as a technique but i do think interestingly enough clinically that with this type of client using my humor as a way to or a channel if you like to get to the energy which is often quite blocked in the child part of the person is a useful and a technique that is effective yeah i can see that yeah if you go the other way and get caught up in that sort of battle you were talking about earlier you're, you've lost yeah if you can get to the part of the child in other words the part underneath the coping mechanisms or defenses in a way they'll allow you in and they're, a way they'll engage with you, you're more likely to get to the part of them which is being so hurt. In a safe way, yeah. They won't feel yeah, like quite they a safe way. Humor. Yeah. They, they, you know, the paranoid might feel tricked by humour, which is an, in, I didn't say that in the last podcast, but a, a, I think the style of character comes from this sort of passive aggressive process, often feels engaged by humour. They don't go quite to the same levels that the paranoid person does. Yeah. I've always found that a good way to work uh, with these people in a safe way to reach what often is called in the books the inner child. Yeah. Which really means the vulnerable younger part of the self. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can see that working. I can also see you doing that in a therapy room as well, Bob. Yeah, yeah, because humour, I like humour. Yeah. Now, it's an interesting one, humour, just sort of touching on that in this moment, because, you know, you're on a fine line again, mm. because the, the, you're after engaging with the child that's been so hurt, that's why they pull your defences up in a safe way, quite correct. But if they feel in some way that you're laughing at them rather than they're being with them, yeah. you'll reenact history. Yeah. If they feel like they're being ridiculed or made fun of or, or anything, yeah. So Hume's okay, I think, from a thought-out place, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, could people call that a technique? Maybe. But I think with these types of people, using humour, I've always found very effective to engage their child ego state because that's where the trapped energy often is. If you can come alongside the vulnerable child, you're more likely to help move towards a reparative process therapeutically than moving to some sort of battle with them. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting, it, you know, just looking at where all this stuff comes from, you know, often what is played out in the therapy room is is reenacting exactly like you say, something from the childhood, something that's happened that made perfect sense at the time. Oh. 
it's mm. just in in the therapy room adult to adult you know interactions it's it's not helpful no their level of procrastination their level of sullenness their level of resistance their level of aggressiveness uh often that often, phrase cut off your nose to spite your face it's yeah. often comes to mind when i work yeah yeah but you see if you think about where all this comes from, to me, it's the battle with the parent in the individuation stage. And so in other words, they are attempting to be seen, to be loved, to be validated from the significant other people, person. Now, if that doesn't happen, then, then, then what they could withdraw and shut down by the, like the withdrawn client, as we talk about in another podcast, they could go into attack, blame and control, like we talk about in another podcast, in this style, what they do is they attempt to get the validations, the strokes and the love by actually acting out negatively. Mm. And then, interestingly enough, when perhaps the therapist, uh, sorry, the client, we could put the therapist later on, sorry, the parent rather than the, uh, you know, the parent in their earlier history has, does then attempt to meet them they then push them away because it's like it's too late yeah. in the framework. Yeah. Yeah, you've had your chance and you missed it. <laughs> yeah, they don't allow the parent to even go anywhere near their hurt places because it's too late. Yeah. Yeah, and then they go around in the circle we talked about earlier. Yeah. So it's, it's a very sad, tragic tail I think because it's an attempt to get a different type of parenting however when that different type of parenting came along in their early history it was too late for them and they pushed them away from a very hurt place yeah. so for the therapist to get to that child and, and engage with them and validate them so they got a different reparative experience has to be done with patience gentleness and in a safe place yeah it's not straightforward therapy this this isn't because if the problem is if you buy into their attacks or their control me mechanisms or their procrastinations or their passive behaviors or their aggressiveness and move into that sort of control battle you'll lose out you'll repeat history you have to and that's that this is why he was i think quite a safe option find a way to engage with the hurt child and, it, and, and that's, that's, that's easier said than done. Yeah, but again, you know, as you're talking, I'm visualising what I would do with my kids or my grandson if, if he's having a strop and, you know, sat quite close with his arms full. It is that, that tickling, that bringing them out of themselves. Forget the mood that you're in. Let's look at this over here and that, you know, distracting them somehow. Oh that's how i see that connecting with the humor but it's a distraction let's get away from the heavy stuff and let's let's look at something less deep let's Just engage that that, connection. Uh, yeah let's engage that hurt part somehow yeah yeah so it's 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 um if you see the therapy as the client's vain attempt to get a different type of you can even look at it like this a different type of parenting which attunes to them, yeah. counts to them, counts for them, and attempts to understand them, then I think you're on to more of a winner. The problem is what we said earlier on the podcast is that if you get, if you buy into their negative threats, their intimidation, their passive resentment, their solidness, um, you will reenact history for them. Yeah. Which again is why it's really important a lot of the time for, for therapists to have supervision to, yeah. to talk about the impact of seeing certain clients on them. Yeah. You, again, I talk a lot about fine lines. There's a fine line in not taking it personally and not being invested in the therapy. If we're invested in the therapy with the client, then sometimes we do take things personally. 
Well, actually, that is true because we're all human. However, or stroke and, if we have enough therapy and supervision ourselves, I hope the investment is in exactly the opposite. In other words, the investment is staying out of these power battles. Yeah. But of course, I think we often need our own therapy to do that. Yeah, yeah. And when I say the investment, I, I meant, you know, the investment in the therapy session and wanting the best for the client. I, I am invested in each and every one of my clients in one form or another. And in doing that, I open up the potential for taking things personally. Yeah. And the other thing, of course, is they don't, they want you to be invested and they don't want you to be invested. Yeah. So, you know, one thing when you talk about passive, the passive part of this type of the, the, the character we talk about, I want to go back to something which is really fundamental, and that is they will want to manipulate you or hypnotically manipulate you to do the thinking for them. Mm. So they then can reject it. Yeah. Now, that's a really interesting one because it's very important in the end that they do empower themselves and grow up and don't stay infantilized and caught in this passive aggressive um, battle they often are. So how does a therapist do that? How does the therapist uh, go to a place where they're encouraging the, the person to think at, in, a, in a safe way? In other words, they encourage them to think without the club, club being so afraid that the work's going to be taken away from them or they could enact out this aggressive place because in the end of the day you do need to get to a place where they start thinking for themselves and not manipulating you to think for them because if you go down that line they'll just throw it back in your face again yeah so it's yeah. an interesting i think the way through it is to get to the child like i've said before and help the child's scare about thinking yeah do you think particularly with passive aggressive clients that the way maybe to do that is through activities yes 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 yeah well, that's, that's often a very good way to do it yeah, yeah. yeah. rather than the thinking and the feeling business to get them doing something yeah because with if you think about it um they're they're invested in in passivity yeah. So they can induce the parent in and then they can, of course, then spit them out again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. If you, so if you can move to behavioral activities or uh, that is a safer way, I think, to go. And certainly through the behaviors, you might get to their um, their, their feelings and then their thinking. Mm. Yeah, without, I don't know, <laughs> hitting the tripwire that can get the defence mechanism up. It, it's, yeah. Oh. I think that's that's where I feel less challenged in a room when we're doing something activity-based, behavioural stuff, mm. Mm. Yeah. rather than trying to outwit each other. <laughs> yeah, 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 because it also uh therapeutically confronts the passivity mm, yeah yeah they, they they need to move and get unstuck or something yeah but you know if you if you think of this as i said before earlier in the podcast it's a tragedy their history because they're, they're attempting to get you know they're attempting to get connectedness mm. nurture intimacy and when it comes, they throw it back again. And that's the whole game. Yeah. So somehow you need to cut across that. And again, I think playing with them is a really good way. Yeah. To engage the child. Yeah. Which again, you know, the, the humor side of things can be used as, you know, behavioral and making that connection that way. Yeah. Oh. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. It's a wonder any of us come out of there alive sometimes, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, with the passive aggressive, and I think with many of these characters, but especially the passive aggressive part, I don't really like, I much prefer you know, playful resistance. Playful resistance, I like that. I much prefer that. Yeah. Um, it, it's often seen as a, a battle to the death. Yeah. 
And of course, we need to find a way where they can honor life and we have a different reparative process. And I still, and as I say, I've probably said the fourth time in this podcast, I think engaging humor and playfulness uh, to connect with their inner child is the way forward. Yeah. So they can learn to connect in a different way. Safe way, yeah, yeah. So what we're doing next episode, Bob, um, do, do we know? Well, you've got your list off, off air. You said, list. Are, we, are we going to do the histrionic? So, I, I, <laughs> let's move on to the histrionic then. What, well, let's do the histrionic and the narcissistic client. Okay. Because they sort of go together in many ways. Uh, but quite, quite often the features of the histrionic client um, is similar to the features of the narcissistic client. And often the narcissistic client and the histrionic client get mixed up interesting so i think that'll be interesting guys. right we're, we're grouping them together then right so until the next one where we'll be doing histrionic and narcissistic yeah that that's uh that's as you said earlier on you know narcissism often is the flavor of the day but I, there's a great call for healthy narcissism which are, which is the genesis of course for self-esteem mm, yeah so, uh, it'll be a great podcast and again, it's a sliding scale. We, we all have narcissistic tendencies. We're human. We are, yeah. We, I can think of many well-known figures for next week we can talk about, but I'll have to be careful. But I can think of many of them. And they are on the right side of this spectrum. But I, but I do think we can put them together, histrionic and narcissism to a certain extent, and they often get diagnosed uh, the wrong way around. Maybe that's something we could do in future, Bob, with these personality traits, is pick somebody in the public eye that we can say that's what they are. That's that. Well, but obviously, in a lot of social media, you know, Trump is often seen as an arch narcissist. You know, uh, I think one, one of the ways that I got to grips with these when I was doing my training was to look at EastEnders and Coronation Street and Emmerdale and look for characters that were displaying certain behaviour types. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very good way. And they're, unfortunately, they're full of narcissists. Oh, yes. <laughs> Look, we're not talking about the actors or the actresses, it's the characters, so we can't get done for libel or anything. No, I, I meant the characters, yeah. Yeah, right, so I shall see you on the next episode, Bob. You will, see you on the Take next care. episode. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> you've been listening to the therapy show behind closed doors podcast we hope you enjoyed the show don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review we'll be back next week with another episode